Good morning, Southside. I'd like to welcome anyone who's visiting with us this morning. We're grateful to have you come worship our God together. Wanted to thank our brother, Jason Sweezy, who brought us the Word of God last week. Was so encouraged by that message and grateful for that dear brother. Oh, my heart is blessed. At the end of the service, we're going to be installing a new elder. Uh, and we have both of our elders who are serving abroad present this morning, so they're going to join us in laying hands upon Jim at the close of the service. Um, Nick and family Alpha will be with us. So this morning we find ourselves in a great text. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2, I see it very fitting as a charge for our new elder and current elders, and yet great application for every soul here this morning. So this passage has just left me pleading before the Lord for Christ-likeness, which is Philippians 2, 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. can feel elusive at times, um, this mindset of Christ, and to be humble as we serve one another and forget ourselves. So let's read our text this morning, and we'll go to our God in prayer. Philippians 2, 19. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of a kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will be coming shortly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this letter that came out of a prison cell. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and the way the Spirit led him and these thoughts that they are inspired now and they're perfect. They reveal to us the mind of our God. And so I pray this morning as we open them up, Lord, that um, by your spirit, you would do application in each one of our lives. God, that you would grow us in humility. You would take away our, our, our proneness to self-glory and to self-seeking. God, help us, as we learned last week, to wash feet, to be humble before our God and to love the brethren. God, I pray that you would do mighty things uh, in each one of our hearts specifically, uh, individually here this morning. And I pray corporately that this truth would continue to bring a sweet unity into our midst in Jesus Christ and the hope of this gospel and the spread of this gospel. Lord, let that be our chief end at any cost. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, we've been working through Philippians 1, 27, where Paul said, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we're working this out all the way from chapter 2 to verse 30. And so how do I live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? And Paul's been teaching us it's with hearts that are knit together for the spread of this glorious gospel that we all love and treasure. We want to see people come to faith in this Christ and to deepen and to grow in faith in this Christ. And so in our unity together, we're to be humble-minded, not looking out for our own interests, but the interests of others. And Paul said, I, I labor for the progress and joy of the Philippians' faith. And I, I, I just see so much of this going on in our very midst. Bright lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation the kingdom of God is in our midst as people are looking and trusting in their God and we're being conformed to the image of Christ. In this section, Paul opens up his heart as to why he runs and why he labors the way that he does. He wants to, to have cause to glory on the last day because of the Philippians' faith and their brightness in this world. And Paul found joy in being spent for the Philippians' faith. He said, I'm a, I'm a drink offering being poured out on top of the sacrifice of your faith, your increasing love and desire 
for Christ. And he calls us, he says, will you enter into that joy? The, the most blessed life, the one of the fullness of joy is, is sacrificing for the good of others and their faith. What did Jesus do for the joy set before him? He endured the cross. And so I've never met anyone living this way that doesn't have an overflowing joy that isn't controlled and based on your circumstances. They found what Paul is after in this letter, and there's just so much blessing to be had in what Paul's teaching us. So now, Paul is going to hold up two examples of what is worthy conduct. He's shown us Christ, he's shown us his own heart for the Philippians, and now he's going to pull out two more examples, and our first one is going to be Timothy. Timothy is this model example, and what I want you to see as he moves to Timothy is this can be done. It's not pie-in-the-sky theology that we understand. I just want you to see you can become these kind of men, women, and children. Do you, do you want to be this kind of man or woman? Do, do you hunger and thirst for this? God, whatever idols are in my life that are keeping me from washing the saints' feet and becoming what Paul's describing, whatever sins are in my life, whatever lack of love or fear or hurts or being overwhelmed are keeping me from this, uh, would you, God, cause me both to will and to do your good pleasure? Conform me into the image of Christ through everything. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. He's working in you to make you die to yourself to serve others, to lay your life out there, to advance this kingdom together in unity. That is what he's doing. And so it, to, to just narrow this laser focus into one thing that I do is conformity to Christ, which is what? To have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, the one who was humble. And so we're just so quick in this day and age to, to break the unity of the Spirit when we have such beauty to hold us together. So as we begin this morning, I want to set the context one more time. Paul is in prison. He's waiting to hear if they're going to cut his head off or not. He has such a love for the Philippians. He's so expressive of it. He says, whenever you come to mind at the beginning of this letter, he says, I give thanks to my God. In Philippians 4.1, he says, my beloved. And here he's about to open up his affection for them again. He, he wanted to be there with them. He says, I, I, I would rather be with Christ because it's very much better. It's gain. But I'm going to remain for your spiritual progress. I am going to stay trying to be that drink offering to grow your faith. And what Paul has heard is there's discord among you. There's a need for greater unity. In Philippians 4.2, he says, I urge you to live in harmony. In Philippians 1.28, there's theological opposition that is going on to the gospel. And then in Philippians 3.2, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers and the false circumcision who are sowing in lies. Philippians 3.18, many walk of whom I've often told you and now tell you even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And so there's great opposition going against this church. And Paul loved this group of believers and his heart beat for them. And I just want you to see what this love did. I'm going to send to you Timothy. Philippi, I'm going to send you Timothy to strengthen you. And so my question this morning is, why Timothy? And the answer is beautiful. If you'll look with me in Philippians 2.19, <clears throat> why Timothy? Well, I hope in the Lord Jesus. Everything Paul was about, everything that Paul hoped for was submission to the sovereignty of God. He submitted all of his plans to the Lord. I make plans, but the Lord directs my steps. He's sovereign over us as we just sang. And so I, I hope in the Lord Jesus, I hope it's his will. I want to send Timothy to you. I want to send him shortly. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Timothy, if that name is new to you this morning. He was a native of Derby or Leicester, which is the region in Galatia. His mother was a Jew. Her name was Eunice. His grandmother's name was Lois. We know that his father was a Greek. And we know that in Acts 16, when, when Paul came, uh, he was already a Christian when Paul met him. And Paul, through this process with Timothy, made him his protege. And in the scriptures, Paul called him his son in the faith, 
his son in the Lord, his true child, his brother, and his fellow servant. He was with Paul in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome. He was with Paul writing several epistles, including this one to Philippi. So he truly, we could say, is Paul's right-hand man. And the Philippians knew him. He was there at the founding of their church. So when he says, I'm going to send Timothy, they know exactly who that is. And I want you to listen to why Paul wants to send him. (laughs) He says, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. And the first thing that jumped out at me is I expected Paul to say something different. I expected him to say, I'm going to send Timothy so that you could be encouraged by Timothy. But he says something different. He says, so that I may be encouraged. In verse 16, he says, so that I may have cause to glory by your bright shining lights. I I want to be encouraged um, as Timothy is sent. And so Paul was so wrapped up in how these Philippians are doing. To die is gain. My life is going to be spent for the building up of your faith. And if you stand, Paul says, then I really live. And you make my joy complete by being of the same mind and and unity of spirit. And so this is a man whose heart is so knit with the Philippians and what they're doing that there's just no indifference in Paul's heart toward them. His life is tied up in their spiritual condition. He wants to see Christ formed in them. So I send you Timothy. And does that not strike a chord in our own hearts? My life just gets consumed with my own plans. And it's not, I wonder how the saints are doing today. Let me call so-and-so. Let me pray for so-and-so. We are one. And when one of us hurt, we all hurt. And one of us rejoice, we all rejoice. Paul is so taken up in this body of believers. And this is the kind of conduct I want you to hear this morning that's worthy of the gospel. To be this knit in heart with one another. This is where the rubber meets the road of an every member ministry in the body of Christ. To learn truth, to apply it in our lives, and how do I minister it to the saints of God? What can I do to encourage the saints in their faith? I want to give myself for the growth of their faith and their conformity to Christ. And so I just want you to just sit before God this morning and say, is there any of this in your heart? Do you honestly feel this way about anyone? Who do you serve like this? Is there a spouse? Is there anyone that the gospel has done this in your heart? And I'll just, as clear as I can, the self-focused seldomly invest their lives in the lives of others. They're always discontent because people are not investing in them. That's how they live their lives. If all your service to others is in the future, when things change, then you missed it. And maybe a word for balance. It's not the quantity of lives that you affect. I want to set you free from that burden. And you always say it's not the quantity, it's the quality. And I don't even know if it's the quality. Maybe it's just that you do. It's that you try. It's that you're stepping out. To, to try clumsily to love the people of God and help their faith grow. This is what the gospel does in a heart. It's conduct that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself. This is what I want for us to keep growing in. And I love what I see, but I pray that we would excel still more. So this morning, we're going to look at seven reasons why Paul is going to send Timothy. And I I was reading, I had my outline and I was reading one of my favorite preachers and his outline was so good, I trashed mine. And I'm I'm going to use his because I'm after your good, not my glory. So I just want you to know if you like it, it had nothing to do with me. First, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged (coughs) when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. So similar, Paul's saying there's no one else of kindred spirit. And so I just 
maybe it's an imagination, but I'm just picturing Paul with the church and Philippi needs help. And he looks out and, and he says, we need to send someone to Philippi because there's these divisions and there's uh, false doctrines and things are coming at them. Don't you think we should send someone? And everybody goes, yes. Well, who's going to go? Hands go down. I'm busy. I've got a new house. I've got a job. I just got married. I just had a baby. And all the excuses begin to start coming and coming. And so Paul looks around and he goes, there's Timothy. And he says, there's no one else like him. There is nobody else like Timothy. In verse 21, they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. Does that take you back just a little bit? It did me. The question I had, I've been asking myself all week is this. As Paul's looking around, who do I send to help the church at Philippi? Would he, would he have passed me by? I don't think I would have made the list. By God's grace, I want to be a, a Timothy. Open your heart up before God. Do you have a spirit like this? Would Paul have chose you? Just look at your last month and you'll get your answer. There's no one else that has a kindred spirit like me, says Paul. It's a beautiful word. It's a compound word that is one-souled. There's no one else who's one-souled with me toward Christ and others with a genuine concern. I'm going to send Timothy to this church. And I want you to consider who's saying this. It's Paul. Wouldn't you love to have that said about you? The, the one man with zeal, passion, heart, knowledge, love has traveled 1,500 miles preaching the gospel, has been put in prison, almost killed so many times. And to say, he's one sold with my mission for life to make much of Jesus Christ and lift up the cross. Timothy is a one sold man with my heart that Jesus has put within me. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me, said Paul. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere and in every church. There is no one else like me, one sold. I send you Timothy. Second, he was sympathetic. I send you Timothy because he, in verse 20, <clears throat> he will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Genuinely, the Greek word means truly, sincerely. I think a good interpretation is really. It won't just be appearance. This is going to come from his heart that he genuinely cares about you, and it's not fake. It's not hypocrisy. It's real. When I was at seminary, I remember one big fellowship I was at. One of the bigwigs said to his wife, and it has stuck with me 30-some years later, he said to his wife, I'm going to go work the tables. And he meant, I'm going to go hobnob and just do my job now of working the tables. That's not what Timothy's talking about. His heart is for your welfare. He cares about you. He has a concern for you. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hireling flees when there's trouble. So he's real. He's not fake. If I had to summarize it, he's, he's a Philippians 2 man. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Timothy has that. And so hear this. this, this jumped out at me this week. You can look like you are concerned for others and you're not. You're concerned about your self-glory and your self-seeking. Last week we heard about Judas and Judas acted worried about money being given to the poor when he just wanted to pad his pockets. But Timothy, I send him because he has a genuine concern for you. The word, uh, he has a concern. It's the same word in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. And so he's saying that we ought to have a concern about others' interests, and one is sin and one is good. Philippians 4, 6, it's a fear. It's a fear. 
You're anxious about things fearfully. This is, this is you're anxious out of love. How are they? I'm concerned. I want to be with them. I'm worried for them. And so their spiritual needs are a genuine concern for us. Thirdly, Timothy was single-minded in verse 21, for they all seek after what? Their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. They all seek after their own interests. I, I don't think you could give a better description of total depravity. They all seek after their own interests. We saw it in Philippians 1. They're preaching to cause Paul distress in his imprisonment. Paul says they're doing it out of selfish ambition. They're preaching Jesus out of selfishness. He says, I don't care. As long as Jesus is preached, I can rejoice. So Paul has seen a lot of things in his journey. He said, Demas has forsaken me for his love of this world. And Timothy, in 1 Timothy goes, in my first trial, they all forsook me. Except Christ, he did not forsake me. In Asia, they've all forsaken me. Paul had seen a lot in his journey. In his conclusion, they all seek after their own interests. But not Timothy. I'm going to send Timothy to you because he has a genuine concern for your own interests. He's a bright star that is just seeking the things of Christ. And what jumped out at me is this is in the present tense He's always seeking genuinely after your good and your interest. It's not like he got lucky one day. This is, what, this is what he did as a pattern of life. That's what the gospel does in a heart. You got some off moments, but this is what the gospel has made us. Timothy's heart for Christ. What was the interest of Christ? Well, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Jesus gave his life for our salvation, our growth, and our ultimate glorification. And I want to take up that interest of Christ and want that for believers and unbelievers. We, we desire that. That is the genuine interest of having the heart of Christ for unbelievers. So are the interests of Christ becoming more and more ours? The longer I live, I see the things growing dim that once charmed me most. Is there one thing that you're going to spend your life on the interest of Christ? I read about Dawson Trotman's funeral, and Billy Graham got up to speak at it. And he said, here was a man who did not say these 40 things I dabble with, but he said this one thing I do. This one thing. Timothy had one interest and it was the interest of Christ Jesus. John MacArthur made an interesting observation. He said, there's three ways you can ruin your life. You can waste it. You can go toward one goal your whole life, and in the end, it was wrong. And thirdly, you can dabble in a whole bunch of things. Timothy was after the interests of Christ. And I pray that we would run toward that one goal, and it's that of Christ Jesus and not our own interests pray for that for my own heart and for yours. So Paul says, I'm going to send Timothy because he's similar. He's sympathetic. He's single-minded. And in verse 22, he's seasoned. But you know of Timothy, his proven worth, that he served me within the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. <laughs> the word is dokamu, which is from the word dokamazo, and we've talked about it in 1 Peter. It was, it's this approving the quality or genuine, genuineness of something by testing, and you would put it in the furnace, and it was usually metal to boil off the impurities so you would have this genuine approved metal. And so God puts us in trials, and things are burned off, so this genuine part comes out, and he's saying, Timothy's been proven. So what Paul is saying, this word for no, uh, uh, but you know his proven worth, it's experiential knowledge. And so he, you guys know Timothy, you've watched him, you've seen him in the furtherance of the gospel, you know this man's value and his worth, and you have firsthand witnessed it, and you've seen him furthering this gospel, and he's been tested, and Timothy's come forth approved. So it isn't that Timothy took some kind of test or he passed a seminary curriculum, he was tested by service, and you guys have seen him get in and have a genuine concern and look at your interest instead of his own. He's passed. 
We've lost this in our seminaries today. We have just made it almost 98% academics. And you, if you're smart enough, you pass it and you graduated and congratulations now, you're a minister. And this is what Paul says we're to do with deacons or elders. We're to test them. We're to test their provenness and their worth and their genuineness. 1 Timothy 3.10, let these also first be tested and then let them serve as deacons if they're beyond reproach. And so these people are proven after testing and service. That's why we have aspiring elders and deacons for that purpose. And if you're not serving in this capacity before you're made an elder or deacon, you're, you'll, you'll be a very poor servant. If you want to go to the mission field and you're not serving here, you'll be a very poor missionary. This is not just for elders and deacons. It's for all of us. I just want to ask you that. Has this provenness about us in the service of the saints come forth. Is that how people would describe you? Is that there's a provenness to how you have served the saints? If I were to bring your name up to someone in the church, would they say, ah, oh, provenness is what comes to mind. Timothy has been proven in the furtherance of the gospel. Fifthly, in verse 22, He's submissive. He was like a child serving his father. Timothy was younger than Paul. Paul was an apostle. And what you see here is humility. There's a, there's a young man in submission to God by being in submission to the apostle Paul. Timothy's not arguing. He's not competing with Paul. He's not arrogant. I got this all figured out. Let me tell you how to do this, Paul. I think one of the worst things that you can do to a young man is put them through just the academics of seminary and throw them into ministry. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, you younger men likewise, be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Timothy's attitude was humble. He's like a child serving his father, not a sergeant, a private serving a sergeant. He came alongside of his father in the faith and he learned with joy. And Paul says, you're my true child in the faith. And I just think all of the examples, I think anyone who's a dad knows this. I, I have to go back 25 years for this illustration because it doesn't happen anymore. But I was, I was gonna stain my fence like many decades ago. And I remember my, my boys, they, they just wanted to be with dad. And they came out there and we worked so hard and for hours in the heat staining that fence. And I just remember what hit me is it was such a joy for them to be working with dad uh, and helping. And I just sat there smiling going, this is sweet to have that joyful. So it, it was 25 years ago. I, can't, I couldn't think of anything since then. Um, <laughs> but it, it was so joyful. <clears throat> And then I was thinking, when we began in Aurora, we started this thing called the Church of the Homeless. And we went downtown to feed them and to love them and to have a service and give them the gospel. And, and really, we began a church. But I remember asking my brother Nick if him and Jackie would come help me. And I just remember the joy. We, we, we prayed that first service, and Jackie looked like a, a girl going into the candy store to go love and serve these saints. And just coming alongside and the, the beauty of how they served that group. And now in a third world country, every day laying their lives out and serving that way. I get that sense from Paul that Timothy serves with me as a son would his father. One of my most impacting times at seminary, it wasn't in a class. It was when the, one of my teachers named Alex Montoya, he took me to, he was preaching at the, the master's college and he put me in his car and, and drove over and I watched him meet people, get up there and preach and how he ministered afterwards. And just the joy of, of watching him minister was so impactful, I'll never forget it. And I just, I think we need more Timothys that come and serve this way. Let's serve together to advance the gospel like a son with his father. 
And so I pray, don't ever lose this beautiful spirit towards those who are older in the faith. It, it breaks my heart when churches see these people who are older as disposable, hurting their marketing strategy. It makes me sick. These are the people who have been proven and tested, and they're still sitting here worshiping God after everything that they've been through in their lives. And as young people, get them. Will you teach me? Will you help me learn how to handle this and grow through this? Hold in esteem these older saints who have journeyed with God through all these years like a son serving their father. That's for free. Sixthly, Timothy was sacrificial. Paul says, in the furtherance of the gospel. When Paul met Timothy, I bet you he had a life direction and I bet he had goals and things that he wanted to accomplish. And Paul calls him to come. Come, be fishers of men, and let's go make disciples. And he laid hands on them, and he prayed over them. And since then, it's been one unending, nonstop experience of advancing the kingdom with all kinds of trials and conflicts, fears within and fears without. And so Timothy set it all aside to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. He left his house, his mother, his father, his grandmother, and he goes, just Matthew, come follow Jesus. And he leaves it all behind. He set it all aside for the advance of the gospel. And he gave his life for the furtherance of the gospel. And so I just want you to get this last point. There, there's a cost to furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might have to sacrifice and deny yourself, the opposite of the American message. You might have to die and sacrifice and, and to just get in there and grit. I watched these guys this week that put up a whole new security system here for, for a whole week climbing on roofs and sweating and it was just beautiful to watch. And I asked the young man today, I said, was that your vacation? You were here every day this week. He goes, yeah, but it was a joy. Thank you. <sighs> Who's willing to pay it? That's what Jesus said. Who wants to die? And take up your cross and follow after me. And then in verse 23, he was serviceable. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. I, I was just thinking, this is Paul's right-hand man, his son in the faith, and he's in prison, and he's going to send his very best to go help them. Yeah, I still remember sending Nick off to Tijuana. Paul says, go, and he goes. Come, and he comes. Timothy was just always available. If in need, that's where he went. And so you can have every trait that we've looked at, all six S's, and not have this one, and, and you've missed it. I'm going to go serve. So what an example of Philippians 2 kind of conduct by Paul and Timothy both, what's going on here. This is one that will cause Paul to glory on the last day, and others will glory because of Timothy. Don't stop at learning the Word of God, applying it to your life without how can I pour this into others. How can I pour my faith into other people to be a drink offering to see their faith grow, the joy of the faith? Nothing brings me greater joy than to watch that. And so just a word to parents. I need to finish up. A word to parents. Timothy was like this. Paul met him because of his mother and his grandmother. So I just, moms, you weary? But look what God did with their ministry to this young boy that literally changed the world. And, and, and what I love about it is it says, Timothy, from childhood, you knew the sacred writings. Since you were a kid, your, your, your mother and grandmother have been pouring it into you. And it says that you knew of, the, of Christ. You knew of redemption. So his, his grandmother and mother 
knew a redemptive historical view of Scripture. They saw Jesus through the whole thing, and they've been teaching Timothy how to see Christ through the uh, Genesis to Revelation. And so he, he's, he's been taught by this faithful mother and grandmother the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I just pray, moms, it's not Mother's Day, but I wish it was. Well, what a high calling. What a blessing. Grandmothers, get fired up. I like grandmothers now because I'm a grandpa and I think it's a high calling. And just pour Jesus into them from every angle, every way you can. And you never know that God's using you to raise up a Timothy. That's for free. I just want to close and, and we got a whole bunch of things we need to do at the close of our service. I just wanted to encourage you as we walk away this morning that Timothy had ebbs and flows in his life. And I want you to see that he had victories and defeats. There are a few years later that Paul has to write to Timothy to encourage him because it appears to be an ebb in his life. And Paul's trying to tell him, Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and perseverance. And so I think he's, he's getting attacked and he's being tempted to back off. And, and he's struggling, and Paul has to come and remind him and encourage him again with the gift that has been put upon him. And so I think Timothy is a good model and example for all that he was, but I, I want him to be an example as well that it, it's a battle. It, it is a battle that we must fight, and, and we might have three steps forward and two back. And I just want you to hear this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling to be this kind of joyful saint, losing your life for the service of others because it's God who is at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. God is at work in each and every one of you to make you into this kind of person like Jesus Christ and to die, to lose your life and go wash other people's feet. Just that's what he's doing in every life here this morning. And again, I feel like I just want to offer to some of you this morning, Jesus Christ, because you're weary and heavy laden with just frustrated because the world doesn't love you enough, the church doesn't love you enough, your spouse doesn't love you enough, and you just live your life looking at yourself, self, 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 that's all that you live for. And Jesus came to set you free from the bondage of that misery. And so I want to invite you this morning to come to Jesus Christ if you sit in that bondage and to have the freedom to love for the first time and to begin to lay your life out for others. You know as you sit here that you are nothing but a big bucket of selfishness. You know that all you do is run through your mind 24-7, me, 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 and you serve no one, you criticize everyone, and you're a slanderer. And I just want this morning that maybe the Spirit of God is working in your heart to say, I'm done with this life of absolute selfishness. Come to Jesus and let him give you rest for your souls. And his yoke is to go do everything I've been talking about, and now it's easy and gentle because the greatest joy you have, come join Paul's joy of loving and serving others because Christ has loved and served you. Come to Jesus this morning. Do you spend more time criticizing the body of Christ than serving it? I'll leave you with that question. Father, I pray for Southside. God, let us look into the face of Christ and lose our lives for the furtherance of the gospel, for faith to be growing in one another, to be deepened to trust you more in every high and stormy gale, to go out to the lost and tell them there's a savior. There's one who can save from their sins and the wrath of God. God, awaken us to this need. Awaken us to our neighbors, to everywhere we go, Lord, just to find ways to, to proclaim this gospel. God, grow us in a deep spirit of this truth. God, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus Christ. And I pray, bless this body. In the name of our precious Savior, amen.